Oh, I hit my fucking bell. What the fuck am I doing? That's like an Olympic lifting blooper probably. Oh, what is up YouTube? We are back with your guys' favorite day of the week so far. Every time I post a lower body for sprints and jumps, it gets a lot of views, so we'll probably just keep crushing those. Um, we got sprints, we got jumps, we got Olympic lifts today. Um, we got safety bar split squats, and then some accessories and ripping it out. Just finished up with BP for the day, and um, yeah, looking forward to it. I was reading the, the Iliad yesterday, and one of the things that, uh, it's kind of the daily message that I liked from it was there's a difference in how you battle. So it's a big battle going on, and it's talking about how it's not death that is feared, but how you die, pretty much. And if you die moving forward um, and facing the battle straight on, there's no dishonor in death. It's just a part of life. They've accepted it. It just happens, even to the best of warriors. What was dishonorable is if you died while somebody was stabbing you in the back, because that means that you were running away from the battle, you were disappearing, you were trying to hide, you're trying to abandon your fight. Um, so how you die, it, it's not if you die, it's not if you fail, it's how. And I think that's a pretty good metaphor for life. I was thinking about this last night when I was journaling. It's like, that, that, that is life in an essence. Like you are going to fail. It's not if, it's when. Like, there's no option. It's you're going to fail. You're absolutely going to crash. You're absolutely going to eat shit. Um, and it's, it's how. It's are you failing in a way where you're getting speared in the back by running away from the challenge that you uh, are trying to face, by not trying, by not putting yourself out there, by not trying new things? Or are you failing facing it fucking head on by doing the things that you're supposed to do, um, by going to battle, by facing whatever the, the challenge is, even if the challenge is bigger than you, even if the, your opponent is better than you, are you facing that straight on? Um, and there can be tactics there, you can do things, but I, I really thought about that message a lot yesterday and I thought it applied to a lot of what we do. I think a lot of people die running away from the battle. A lot of people die getting speared in the back. Um, and it is definitely a dishonorable way to die. And it's, I think a lot of us die daily in that way. And, and we feel it again, that's where that guilt, that's where that shame comes from. It's like, we feel ourselves running away from that battle. We feel ourselves running away from the opponent that probably is better than us. That probably is going to kill us, um, going to beat us, going to better us in that battle. But that's going to happen regardless. It's gonna happen whether you run away or whether you face it head on. And I think life and the universe and whatever is out there judges us much more, and ourselves and the people around us judge us much more, much more on the fact of, did we face that battle head on or did we face it running away? And did we get beat by it facing it head on or did we get beat by it running away? And just the, the acceptance that the failure is going to happen regardless is I think what a lot of people don't realize. They don't realize that every day they're getting taken out by running away from that battle because the battle doesn't go away. You're just failing on the run. And I don't think a lot of people see it that way. I think they see it as, oh, I'm avoiding that failure by avoiding the battle. And it's like, no, you're dishonoring yourself, your family name, everything that's been putting you into you up to this moment by not facing that challenge. So today we're gonna face the challenge head on and we're gonna rip it, let's go. All right, we got some DAC XLs here, sprinting, got to touch. Left foot on the left plate here, right foot on the plate here. Uh, I like the frequency, change up your stride length a little bit, change up the frequency, then you kind of take off from there. These feel really, really cool. Um, I'm going to do two plates to start for a couple reps, then I'll add in plates as I go. Um, keep opening it up there, so let's do it. Ooh. Woo! Fast as fuck, boy. So again, with these constraints, most of it, like you, you can be pretty specific with constraints. If I want to work on somebody lengthening or shortening their stride length, uh, increasing the frequency of foot strike, uh, decreasing, kind of the same thing. If you're going to lengthen uh, stride length, you're going to um, increase or decrease um, the frequency. But whatever aspects you want to work on specifically, you can. That's the nice part about the constraint led approach. Honestly, though, the nicest part about the constraint led approach is it, get a, it gets athletes out of their own heads when they're sprinting, jumping, moving, gives them a new movement problem to solve and allows them to solve it in their own way, a multitude of ways. So my first approach when it comes to the constraint led approach with all of this stuff is throw a lot of stuff at the athlete. 
we'll do this. I mean, we'll do hundreds of different sprint variations, hundreds of different jump variations, hundreds of different uh, lift variations. And not until we really get to somewhere specific where I'm really noticing something pop up, are we gonna really drill down into, okay, we need to do this certain specific constraints. Um, but again, I, most athletes that I work with, I would say 99.99% of athletes that I work with, the general approach of just adding in different movement problems for them fixes a lot of stuff organically because it exposes a lot of stuff organically. So they're gonna suck at one drill, excel at another drill, and then you can work on the psychological side of things there of giving them small wins on drills that they're good at and giving them uh, things to focus on and drills that they suck at and giving them kind of that exposure to both. But it also kind of naturally solves a lot of issues by kind of waving the things that they're good at, waving the things that they suck at, and usually they find a nice little base level of raising the things that they suck at and continuing to excel at the things that they're good at and bringing that thing up. But I don't get super specific with the constraints unless we really, really need to. And this is a little different than if we're like doing pitching mechanics where you can get pretty specific. But even there, I think if you just create, and this is for most athletes, uh, you're gonna use examples like Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt probably needs very specific constraints because he's at the 1% of the 1%. But most college athletes are just, they're, they're not there yet. Uh, and high school athletes specifically, you need to create general movers first general throwers of the ball, general sprinters, general evaders of tackles, general uh, pursuiters of tackles, general tacklers in general. Um, small things like this, like you need to create that general aspect first and most athletes are very, they're missing that piece. So how would you use the constraints here? Again, just, just pepper them with the constraints until we're really starting to think, see things pop up and those data points allow you to eventually progress into specific constraints, but literally most of the time, just giving them enough constraints allows them to sort themselves out through this movement problem. The body is much smarter than you are as a human. Let them solve the problems. Let them see what happens. Oof. All right, added third plate. So we're gonna go left, right, left. See how this one kind of turns out. Oof. I kind of cheated that last one. I went straight from right plate to left plate. I want to get two feet down in between that, that second plate. So another whole stride instead of just skipping that. So I'm going to fix that this time, hopefully, or eat shit trying. Here we go. Oh! All right, that one kind of sucked. I felt like fucking footwork king there. That's not what I was trying for. Oh, we're just going to go straight through. That was a failed idea. Terrible idea, Austin. Oh, sometimes that happens. Keep it rolling. We'll do, uh, I'm just gonna go three in a row. Get a little bit longer sprints into it. Then we'll just go closer there. One, two, three. All right, now we're going to left, right, left. A little bit more speed in. Here we go. Ooh, there we go. I think that's another thing about the constraints too. Sprints are feeling good today. I'm feel, like I'm enjoying this variation. I'm going to hit way more sprints today than I would if I was just sprinting in a straight line. Bored as fuck, right? So I've been enjoying this variation. I can keep fucking adding plates forever until my ape brain is disinterested in this. So the volume with these movement problems has been a really nice piece. Volume with really good intent. Um, and that's something that you don't get when interest level is gone. And something we like, as coaches, we like, it's, uh, it's all physiological, like your CNS will burn out after five sets of three with like lifts or whatever the fuck they're talking about. It's like, bro, it, you're just totally eliminating the psychological side. Like when somebody is actively engaged in a task, they can do so much more than the other end. And when they're not, then it's time to not do five by three and force them through that system. But uh, man, some of the things we talk about are just super silly. So now we got four plates, left, right, left, right. I'm gonna back up a little bit. Oof. Oof. All right, last one here, then I'm gonna hit two flying tens uh, as I'm pairing my jet drops, some lateral hops and some broad jumps with these, and then we'll get to some Olympic lifts. Let's do it. Oof. Uh. So here we got some broad jumps. We're going in between the plates. So a little variety here, short distance, long distance. Then we got a stick on the plate for the last one here. We'll vary up these distances here. But as soon as we touch, we're going. Let's get it. 
Oh, that was way too close. Ew. Oh, that ponytail fell off. We're gonna really send this one. Oh, let's go. Oh, one more. Yeah, let's go. So I first got the idea of these variable like range jumps from Rob Ossie, I believe is how you say his name, but I had him on a podcast. I just talking about how his high jumpers, a lot of times he'll have them go like 70% or triple jumpers, 70%, long jumpers, 70%. And the ability to control your body and master the range of your body allows you to break through a lot of plateaus, but just understanding the, like what it takes for the fluidity, the rhythm of your body to hit 70%, 80%, 90%, 100%, and the differences between those, and knowing when to crank yourself up, knowing how to scale yourself back rather than just running your head through a brick wall of always maximum intensity. And I think these are just, again, smaller things, smaller pieces to the puzzle when it comes to athleticism that are not really talked about a lot, but you work with the best athletes in the world and they're able to gauge what a true 70% is, what a true 80% is, what a true 90% is. And I think there's a... Uh, there's um, benefits in working some of that range jumping um, in some of your training. So I'm gonna add a little twist here. So we're gonna go 180, 180, and then we're going. Oh, that was kind of smooth. One more rep of those. Then we got these lateral side to side hurdle hops, trying to be bouncy off the ground, nice and low, back and forth, four reps, back and forth here. Oh! Just like we've been doing, these single leg drops, band assisted this week, been bob getting bodied by this, uh, this height. These are the last couple reps here. Hopefully start to stick them a little bit better. Increase the height. Feeling good today, man. Been jumping. Nice. Here we go. Oh, come on. Stick it. My shoulder pop there. That's how soft I am. Fucking old bastard, bro. Shoulder popping on a depth drop. What are you doing? Here we go. Ah, dang. Just gonna keep pushing these heights. Wouldn't really recommend an athlete. If I was doing this, I'd probably have them bumped down, but I'm gonna stick, stick this, man. Collapsing just a little bit at the bottom, but I also think it gets you used to it just a little bit more. I think I'm bailing just a little bit, like preemptively. Come on. Yeah, better. Still, when I stick, falling just a little bit with that foot, stick that. Last one here. Oh, come on. So when I get really high, I'll cut the reps from five reps, each set to three. And if I'm really, really pushing it, I'll just do one at a progressively height. But we're at a three right now, ripping these. Bah, that was better when I'm reaching out the box, not jumping as high. We'll get here. One day this is gonna look like child's play. Jumping from the ceiling. All right, here we go. Ah. All right, let's go rip some Olympic lifts, dude. Big jump day, big sprint day. Feeling good, let's go. All right, we're doing hang snatches today. Um, doing these hang snatches on the day that I just saw Will Rattel, fucking psychopath, uh, ripping 315 on snatches from the ground. So that makes my snatch journey Fuck, I'm, makes me really excited for that as we're, uh, we're ripping one plate here for the hang snatches, but one day we will be that, that big of a specimen. That dude's a fucking animal, even better dude. But yeah, 315 on a snatch, dude, unreal. Oof. 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 
So one thing I've had to switch with snatches, I make smaller jumps than with other lifts. And I kind of just meet high to other lifts, but it's because I'm capable of meat hitting other lifts. Attack is the snatch. I'm so technically deficient with it that I got to make smaller jumps. Otherwise I keep fucking meat heading. It's like 135 felt super easy. My meat head instinct just go 185 right away. I feel like I get bodied by that. So we're just going to go, oh, 155 here. Just keep ripping it up. Oh, that was gross. Oh, I didn't bring my hips at all. Oof. Oh. Ew. Try to keep that one close to the hips. Just went forward. Feels pretty light. I don't know how to describe the fact that it feels light, but super inefficient. Like the bar does not feel heavy. It doesn't feel like I'm getting bodied. But there's like a sticking point to where like, if I don't get to a certain point, I'm just gonna get bodied by the weight. Super weird. I know, it's not really that weird. Just, I suck technically at it, but keep pushing weight. Let's go. Oh, I hit my fucking bell. What the fuck am I doing? That's like an Olympic lifting blooper probably. It's probably not supposed to be able to, probably not supposed to wear these belts. I don't fucking know, bro. Come on. Come on. Get up. Oh, that's so gross, dude. Ah. Oof. Nice. Oh. Ah. Ah, second one was the cleanest. That one felt the grossest. I'm like not used to catching in that deep overhead squat position, and I'm thinking I'm bailing on it. Not, not necessarily as a strength thing, but just almost like a, just not used to going there, and I feel like it's wrong. I don't know, I'll have to watch it back, but it feels like I'm getting to that bottom position, and it feels like I'm not used to handling that collision at the bottom, so I'm just dumping instead of just dealing with that bottom position. It's kind of weird, because I can do the depth drop jumps pretty well in there, so maybe it's that overhead position, but once I get in there, and I, like I stuck it after that first rep, one that I missed, stuck that bottom position, felt really stable and strong. Um, but it's just a goofy, goofy almost like inhibition thing my body's doing, where it's like I get there and it feels like it's wrong, it just dumps rather than sticking and holding. So I'm gonna hit this for another couple reps um, just to get used to that. That is, I believe, a hang snatch PR. I would have to go back and look at the videos, but I'm pretty sure last time I tried this, I, I failed miserably at it, thinking I could get it easily. Um, so that was cool. Got it for a couple reps, and we'll keep ripping those. And then we'll go safety squat, lunges, and then go from there. With, uh, with the snatches, we're gonna hit three up max, reverse lunges here, gonna go hand supported when that right foot is back to work on that broken toe. Uh, supports it just a little bit more, be able to uh, actually load that quad up rather than just break the toe. So we we'll go three up max, see how heavy we go here with these. We got super cat jumps, and then we'll get into some more accessory type lifts. I really liked the look and feel of that hand supported one much better than the um, non hand supported one. Um, hand supported one felt like I was uh, doing a much better job, staying nice and long with that uh, shin angle, which I liked. Um, it's not to say one's better than the other, but I'm gonna start switching over to doing that. The goal is not like a true hold on as hard as possible, like a Hatfield squat, a little, just a little bit of balance there. And I think it keeps me a little bit longer than when I was doing unsupported. So I'm gonna switch to those, three at max. Oh. 
Uh. All right, crank 315, they'll probably call it a day. Got some Subtronics banging in the background for the last set. We're gonna go see them this weekend. It's going to be legendary, melt our face off. Let's go, let's melt our legs off first. Oh. Then our max output jump of the day, super cat jumps, 15 total jumps. Supposed to be partners resisted, where a partner will push down when you jump back up, but we just load up the band a bunch here. Three of them. Boom. All right, then just a couple accessories here. First one, we got those curls that we did last week. Um, C.D. Jefferson curls here from uh, range of strength. But now we're gonna do reps instead of the ISO. We're folding through, big stretch. We just got eight of these. Oh, I like pulsing in the stretches. Just get a little bit deeper. My butt cheek's gonna be so sore tomorrow. I feel destroyed already. These are brutal for the core, man. It's like a crunch. <laughs> Woo. Then we got the single leg hip holes that we did last week as well, or double leg hip holes we did last week, but we got single leg this week, so we're gonna go iso pull, overcoming, then we're gonna rip rapid reps here. Building up those hip flexors. Ripping them. Yeah. Oh, those are good. Oh, I've been thinking it's probably a little bit better if you're laying prone, you have a partner pulling, and then you can do rapid reps just so you don't have any of the hanging or swaying involved. You can just rip straight hip flexor, but. Don't got a partner today, so this is how we're gonna rip it. Even the pole is much better with a partner than with the band. Band's nice for those rapid reps at the end, but otherwise partner's much better. Here we go. Ah. All right, the last thing we got, straight leg adductor hold, bottom leg in. Top leg off, holding this position. We'll work adductor here, oblique here. Absolute ripper, two minute hold. And let's suffer. Oh, oh yeah. All right, that's a day. All right, that was a ripper of a day. Lots of jumps. I was probably jumping and sprinting for too long for my schedule today. Um, but yeah, solid. Got after a lot of things. Be out in that snatch. Felt really good on the sprints and jumps. Um, today is a day we're probably setting a more of a time limit. Um, just feeling really, really good at the start of the workout. Felt pretty uh, gassed and down towards the end. And it was just, I mean, it was just a time thing. It wasn't even like a um, physiological thing. It was just fucking, I've been here since 6 a.m. And it's uh, 2 p.m. right now. Not working out straight, but... Uh, had group this morning and then uh, softball and then the lift after. But yeah, we got other shit to do today. So um, these oranges scam me, bro. That's a misunderstanding. They all said citrus orange on it. And it tastes like a grapefruit. It looks like a grapefruit. I got baited, bro. Not as good. But pretty good day today. Going to go. Crush some eggs. I just crushed uh, my protein shake. I got a little bit left, but 
collagen, protein. And we got eggs, venison later. Um, gonna go for a walk. That's something that uh, I realized throughout my days, I just gotta do a better job of walking. Like, I've been doing this thing where I, I walk every day, but like some days I've been like rushing my walk for other things. I'm like, my walk is like my number one creative spot. The number one part of my day in which I feel like I'm productive and moving things forward. Um, and productive in the long-term sense. Like I'm coming up with all my ideas, probably the most at peace, probably the most grounded version of myself. And I've been rushing that for other things. And I'm like, I just gotta reprioritize. And it's not even that I'm rushing it to get into other things down. It's that like, I get a little anxiety of like, I'm wasting time walking. I just have to rethink what that walk does, how it sets up the rest of my day. And how if I spend an hour walking versus 20 minutes walking, how much more productive I'm gonna be later in the day um, and just higher quality work. I think that's another piece of it. It's like um, social media kind of makes it a spammy, like is that that die? you gotta get everything done, you gotta post, you gotta do all this stuff. Um, and that's really why I started doing YouTube as well because like I realized like, I, was, I was fucking trying to cut a 28 second video down to a 25 second video for the algorithm and things like that. And like still doing it, there's still a part to that, but man, like that just seems like so gross, so hacky, so like, and, but you have to do it, otherwise you're, 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 literally your account will not get seen. It's kind of crazy. Um, and I didn't really love, I don't really love that approach, man. Um, there's a piece to the top of the funnel marketing that you can do, but the Instagram, that's literally all you can do. I mean, your max video is a minute 30 that you can put on Instagram. If you put out a minute 30 on Instagram, nobody's watching you in five seconds of that. So it's, it's, it's kind of crazy, like the short attention span and how much they're training your brain to be short and fast. Um, and again, there's, there's also an artwork to that too. I understand that. Like I'm much more distilled in my thoughts. I take a big idea and I distill it into a small thought process there, make it make sense. Like I know there's a lot of rambling that goes on in these YouTube videos, but I also believe there's a lot of gold that is in those rambles that, um, can piece together. So I truly believe there needs to be a balance, especially for me and my own mental health of being able to take these big ideas. And this is kind of my idea for YouTube is take these big ideas, my rambling ideas here, distill it down into a more fine tuned version, that 20 second version on YouTube or on Instagram um, and have that balance of those two playing back and forth of big ideas, still getting your big piece of artwork here, distilling it down into those 20 second bits um, that are a little bit quicker, um, maybe a little bit funnier, a um, little bit more quick hitting. But anyways, that's my thought process. Um, got another mic on the way. So hopefully the goal is also to bring other coaches on and work out with other coaches. So I got these workhorse training shorts on. Um, if you guys don't know the lore there, um, Locken was our intern four or five years ago. He first got connected with Jake. Jake connected me to him. He was our intern. Now he's just fucking taking off with everything that he's doing at Workhorse. Um, so it'd be sick to work out with guys like him, Welty, Will, Jake, travel to medicine through movement, like just travel all over the place and make videos, training videos with those guys. Um, so long-term vision, if you're watching this right here, that's the long-term vision of the YouTubes and being able to do almost like working podcasts with those and other people outside the field too. Um, trying to get a little bit more into the daily thoughts. I think after my walks and later at night, again, I'm a little bit more grounded, I have a little bit less to do, and I get a little bit more philosophical, a little bit more psychology, a little bit deeper in, in my thought processes. And I know it's not as entertaining, but it's something that I thoroughly enjoy talking about and working on those thought processes. And that's the one thing YouTube allows me to do is break out of the Instagram rabbit hole of you can only be the strength conditioning coach um, and you have to be that for your business type thing. And obviously, I, I take that to extremes there as well. but. Um, man, it would be cool to just have like philosophy talks with people or psychology talks or just, just talks with people that don't have to have a purpose about strength conditioning. So I think YouTube can kind of be that outlet for that and, and transform those things there. So anyways, good day today. Felt fucking good. Gonna rip this stuff up, edit it and crush it. Appreciate you guys watching. Keep chopping wood.